The views and opinions expressed on this show belong solely to the hosts and their guests and do not reflect the views of any onside institutions unless explicitly stated. What's up, everybody? My name is Steve Vandewal. And I'm Justin Klosser. And, and we're, we're your hosts, hosts of Cannabis, cannabis Cum, Laude, Cum Laude, a podcast devoted entirely to cannabis. We're going to talk cultivation, business, medicine, politics, culture, advocacy, and everything in between. The cannabis industry is complicated. It's robust. It has a lot of moving parts. And it's our job to help you understand it just a little bit better. So tune in every week for a brand new episode. And if you have a question that you'd like answered on the show, send it on over to questions at CannabisCumLaude.com. Thanks. Enjoy the show. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Cannabis Cum Laude. And you're not going to miss this one because we're going to take a, uh, a deep dive into breeding and genetics with none other than our homeboy, the owner of Hashtag Hydro Inc., the co-founder of Rock City Genetics, and the coordinator for the upcoming Rock City Cannabis Carnival, our good friend, the hydro guy, Rob Bonfiglio. What's up, guys? Not Ron Bonfiglio. Yeah, that we've done that yeah. twice now. I think Ron Bonfiglio. You yeah. closed it out with Ron. Ron. Yeah, yeah you introduced um, me as Rob. <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> screw it up again, but uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. For lots going me. on in your world. Yes, yes, lots going on all at once. Yeah, it's but, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were talking about real quick before we dive into today's topic, breeding and genetics, which is super exciting for me. We, I, I, I kind of want to do a shout out because, as I'm sure you can see, my eyes are about as closed as they've ever been on this show. Uh, I got to hang out with a couple of cool people before the show, the loud cloud, and they made oh, sure yeah. I was thoroughly elevated before I got here. So, um, yeah, I am elevating my state of mind and I want to encourage all of you to do the same. Um, here. And, uh, I'm pretty sure the rest of my friends here were also oh, yeah. pretty lit coming in today. Oh, yeah. So, uh, what are we, uh, yep. what are we ripping on boys? <laughs> Oreos. Oreos. I, IB grown Oreos. Yeah. Okay. What's IB? That's the grower. Oh, word. IB. Yeah. Oh yeah. And we're. What Does do you, it taste like Oreos? It's got like a doughy, cakey kind of taste. Yeah, I wouldn't say like Oreos. No, not specific. Not like cookies and cream. No, no, no. <laughs> How the hell do you get something to taste like cookies and cream? I feel like uh, with added terpenes and extra BS, genetic breeding. You know yeah, what I mean? maybe cross selection. Do you, have you ever actually had? Uh, I guess maybe I've had cookies taste before, like a cookie-ish kind of. Do- yeah, you get like doughy those doughy batter. terps. Yeah. Apparently, dough is like not a, a terp profile. But... Have, have you ever had huh. cream come out of bud for real? No. Mm-mm. I haven't. I've had one that kind of tastes like vanilla-y, kind of. But if no. you've had cream, put it in the comments. I want to know what kind of strains you're smoking or cream. cultivars, as we really like to prefer to them. Cultivars. Uh, what, what are you What are you burning on that tastes like cream? Let me know. Um, so. Today, like we said, we're going to get into breeding and genetics, which is really, really exciting. But before we get into the complicated part, we kind of want to go over some fundamentals, right? Yeah. And so you see it all over social media, right? It's everywhere. People are constantly asking, is it a boy or is it a girl? Oh, yeah. Can you confirm, is it a boy, is it a girl? Um, <clears throat> once you know, it's like, almost hard to not see what it is right right right. but like a lot of people just don't know you kind of have to be taught so in your opinion what is the best way to determine whether it's a boy or a girl Uh, some show signs early right you might get a plant that shows like it's pistols early in veg but if you're running a reg pack right and you want to determine sex you have a couple different options you can do it the old school way and just kind of let them take their course, flip them into bloom. You'll notice within two weeks, maybe even a little sooner. Um, there's genetic testing now, sex testing, that you can take a, a whole punch sample of the leaf and send that in within 14 days of germination. Um, my preferred way is I raise mothers of each seed. You know what I mean? I label yep. them, uh, say it's Gorilla Glue. Gorilla Glue 1 through 10, if I did 10 seeds. I would get them big enough to where I can just throw them into bloom and I'm not too worried about it. I will take a clone off each one of those plants, correlate my labels, make sure they root, and then throw the plants into flower. And then I let them go all the way through, wean out the males if you see them, which you will see little sacks, all right? You will see two white pistols come out if it's a female. Um, And then, yeah, I pick my winners. I always do a pheno hunt. Anytime I'm running any kind of new pack, 
I always do the Pheno hunt to source my best one or the one that has the characteristics that I like. Absolutely. Um, I actually heard on the Grow From Your Heart podcast yep. that a lot of people just take their clones, throw them into uh, whatever substrate they're going to be using and just put them right into 1212. Correct. Don't even worry about it as far as whether they're going to root or not. Correct. Just strictly as a sex test, which is pretty cool. Yes, you um, can do that too. So when you're sexing them, I mean, you can find a lot of diagrams on Google, which I encourage you to do if you've never seen it. But, and you know what, we're, we're going to either throw up a link in the notes or maybe I can get uh, a couple good Scott pictures. to drop a couple pictures in here. Um, after the fact, we'll see. Hopefully he's feeling nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but, so what you're typically going to see with a male or a female, like he said, is a two little pistols or a sack, right? For lack of a better word, it's like a ball, but that ball is kind of going to be on like a stock. A neck. So yeah. a way that you can kind of tell ahead of time. Plus there's also, if you have a jeweler's loop, you can see um, the female flower will only have like a single slit in it where that's going to then open up. Whereas the male flower and pre-flower uh, the bud is going to have like five lines in it because there's five petals that split apart. Correct. So if you can see tight enough, you'll be able to see those lines to help you out. But you can also tell that like when it's on its stalk, like if it's on a stalk, it's more than likely a male. Absolutely. Like it could, it could be because you have really terrible light and it's a super weird pre-flower, but more than likely it's a male. So have you ever seen, have you, have you had experience with males? Have you ever like done a reg pack and found a male yourself? Nope. No, so you would have to look up pictures right now, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. I, I I have a gist, but I've never... Uh, I don't have enough trials, a ton of trials under my belt. Right. Um, but I've been lucky where I, I haven't had any issues. But hemp, are they all guaranteed females? We bought fem seeds from Oregon CBD. Okay, they do have reg seeds, though, correct? Yeah. For the hemp? Yeah. Okay. That'd be yeah, fun. so um, for grain cultivars or dual purpose, grain and fiber, yep. even sometimes just the fiber, but that's kind of like counterproductive to have that in there if you're only harvesting for fiber but um they will commonly be male and female which is actually why there is a lot of um cross like issue issue with uh the legalization of cannabis and like the hemp market there's like a whole lot of pushback you can you can or you can't grow outside one farm or, an acre away from another one cross pollination from the wind yeah. it. It i mean it could do it a, a mile away Two miles, yeah. right? That's a big thing. In, uh, issue there is in. a paper out. I don't, I can't remember what it is. If I can find it, I'll put the link in the notes um, that determines like how far it's yeah. actually able to kind of Travel. realistically reach. <laughs> and um, that's for, for outdoor, they're talking about. Right. It's an outdoor hemp field and an outdoor cannabis field. Correct. Absolutely. I mean, but this stuff still can come in through your fans and pollinate your greenhouse. Oh, it's or, easy to transport pollen on your clothes. That's on why your clothes. When it comes to breeding, you have to be like, just as sterile as almost not not almost as sterile, but close to as sterile as like surgery. growing mushrooms. Surgery, yeah. Sur yeah. surgery yes, or yeah. cultivating mushrooms. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have to be pretty clean. Yeah, you and you gotta make sure like if you're in your breeding area and you also have like a smokable flower area. Correct. You have to like make sure you're in different clothes, you're washing your hands, you're doing all of this stuff to make sure you're not like contaminating. Right. And seeding out your other rooms essentially which might like not be the worst thing to have those seeds yeah. but like you don't, don't want to smoke no. them or have to pick them out yeah i uh a couple of years ago i was um when i was first kind of getting into the hemp side and doing a little bit of consulting and trying to learn i was driving around farms in buffalo and new york talking to hemp farmers and just saying what's your experience and like and i remember uh my my partner at the time his name's kyle we went out to this farm in buffalo and they were telling us that they had like acres and acres of hemp and they came out one morning and there was just a yellow cloud of pollen over the entire field and it pretty much wiped their whole operation. What? So I can't, and you know, and that's, that's hemp, which is cheap. You know, imagine you're running a greenhouse with, you know, primo high THC stuff in it. That could be, it could take your business down overnight. Oh, there'd be lawsuits filed. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, it's, it's <clears throat> cheap, but the, uh, I mean, I guess we did it pretty right with our taxing structure, but I was going to say the the taxing and cost with hemp follows suit, right? It's not the same risk that there's going to be trying to get into the 
adult use market, right? right. That's there's just going to be a lot more cost risk up front, oh, no even doubt. before you get into the growing and having cultivars. Because once you get a good couple crops, which might cost you, or a good couple uh, cultivars, which might cost you a couple G's to acquire those genetics. You never know. Oh yeah. But then you can propagate those forever unless there's some kind of non-propagation agreement. But like if you're in the commercial industry, you probably shouldn't be buying those types of genetics. (laughs) Pretty much dude. There's like a, there's no Monsanto rules on seeds and genetics out here. It's just kind of like the, and most seed companies will even put that out and tell you like, you can buy our seeds, you can breed with them, keep them, choose them, you know, do whatever you want. Anybody that like wants to hold on to their genetics like that is just kind of like Monsanto minded, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do. I get it. Like intellectual property is important, but like with it being federally illegal and with it being, you know, uh, uh, it, it becomes very complicated. And it's like you can either try to hold on to it or just keep breeding the best quality products you can, and you know, let the market do its thing. But I, I think you're right. I think it's kind of whack to like. Especially in an emerging market. Especially, well, then I wouldn't have been smoking the Oreos that I smoked on the way here. You know what I mean? Because that's technically max yields cut of Oreos that IB Grown got. You know what I mean? And then did it himself, found his own, you know, bomb fino, yeah. and then puts it out on the market as IB Grown Oreos, still paying homage to max yields. But, you know, that wouldn't be possible if this everybody hoarded it. He found. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You can't hoard them like that. Clone only, baby. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so in your opinion, if we're leaving the science out of it, cause, and I think that that is a convenient tool to be able to do the sex testing. But I think if you're going to be a grower, you need to be able to determine the difference on your own. Oh, absolutely. Site. Absolutely. And so it's something you should learn. And so I, we kind of touched on this a little bit. You said some go early and we'll show pre-flowers in early flower, but yep. for most most cultivars, the normal ones, not those really urgent, like, oh, I want to get it in. Right, right, plants. right away. Like, <clears throat> when are you seeing pre-flowers pop up that are, are typically distinguishable? Like, is there is there an average time into flower that you see them start to come out? Oh. Or like... I mean, I've seen them come out as early as four days, and I've seen them be as late as like 11, 12 days, you know, sometimes even two weeks. It really depends on sometimes more indica ones will show earlier because they're earlier flowering types. Sativas take a little longer. They might take longer to, you know, show signs of sex. Really depends on the cultivar strain, you know what I mean? Or Yeah, that's true. Those longer flowering ones are just typically the whole process is drawn out, so it's going to show a little bit later. Then they also have products <laughs> that will stress the plants early, like real early flower, okay. and get them to show signs and put on flower sooner. So it depends. I mean, you could you could technically force them last week of veg, use like a product like that, like um, Moab, Mother of All Blooms. Yeah. It's just a powder that pretty much stresses them, puts them into flower a little sooner. You might see flowers, I don't know, four or five days sooner at that rate. Is that is that a, uh, a worthwhile investment in your opinion? I guess that's a pretty on-the-spot question to ask. No, because I actually use it myself. Like okay. I use the Moab <laughs> last week of veg, first week of bloom at a very low rate. And then last two weeks, I stop, well, before my flush, I should say, not last two weeks, because I flush for my last two weeks. But before I do my flush, I will stop everything else, and then I'll use the Moab again at the end, and it stresses them and again, and it's a hardener at that point. Mm. So it's dual, dual purpose. No dyes, just a white powder. Interesting. Okay, so is that something that I need to worry about as far as, like, coming through in the flavor using it at the end or is it is it pretty inert kind of just it's it's pretty inert in itself i mean again you use like a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon for five gallons so you really you really don't use too much yeah and you only you you only well in my case it's easier for me because i do multiple top feeds a day so i could choose to run it for one day change out the water do something different do something different than just start my flush a little bit of a just a boost here how are you yeah Uh, Add that to my bill later. Definitely want to give it a run. Got you. Thank you. Got you. <laughs> yeah, I've seen or I've seen videos like of back in the day, like in Jamaica, they used to take like a machete and split the stalk, like I don't know, six to eight inches from the the soil. They would stick the machete in yeah, the yeah, middle yeah, of the yeah. plant and then push down just to stress them out and bring out more resin. Really, as That's a natural crazy. natural defense mechanism of the plant. Yep. Really. They go into like attack mode, so. They tighten up and secrete more resin. That's their only like defense mechanism. I think I brought this up before. 
dude soma used to like light a fire yeah yeah and it just the heat would like freak it out and it would resonate a just stressing your pretty, plants yeah you know, just put them through hell you got to be kind of a sadist to be like a top shelf grower you know I'm like you gotta be willing to get in there and break a branch and just know it's gonna come back and like maybe not like snap clean let me make that clear yeah like, i do that in early veg actually yeah like the kyle cushman method he'll literally like take the stalk in between his fingers and go opposite ways and cause stress fractures yeah, all the way all up the way the up stalk. every node yep yep me really? too. Mm -hmm. what's that do thickens so that up that stem gives it the strength less need for support yep. i mean you're gonna get not floppy nuggets honestly it's, my last round i didn't do it and i'm coming up towards the end wispier. and these things are like falling back through the trellis you know what i mean just because they're like thin stemmed and heavy yeah, right? it's yeah. almost like muay thai fighters right like they kick trees they break like micro fractures in their shins and shit to build up this the bone Callus. and the cartilage and yeah. shit like that you're almost doing the same thing to the plants and the yep. cell walls of your plant interesting mm -hmm. yeah well they they essentially they can't fix that spot but they can fill it in the gap in between with material and then enclose it and so you end up almost seeing like a knuckle where Correct. you ended up breaking it yep. and like it after that knuckles up you wait a little bit you can actually hit that note again and knuckle it up again and you could i wouldn't say like go crazy but you can no. do it two or three <clears throat> times where you go up each branch throughout depending on how long you veg but with plant counts you're going to want bigger plants you know what I mean? To stay legal. So I've actually had one of those knuckles be a weak point on one of my plants. I did it too close to the top and the Ooh. top cola, like week six was getting heavy. It was above the trellis. It wasn't fully supported. And right in that knot, no. that thing just snapped oh, no. Damn. right, right in the breeze, man. Them fans. First. Oh man. It was savage. That's sad. Check, <laughs> check your cultivar. See what they like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I, think, I think that was a critical <clears throat> cushion. It didn't like that. Yeah. No, no. Well, I've never, I've never honestly personally had any luck with like Kush genetics as far they're, they're finicky. Not that I haven't had luck, but like they're, they're more of a problem child than anything else. It's so funny. Or like OGs or. This must lean more critical then because this thing is just like an autopilot plant. Oh, really? Just, yeah. There's like no killing this thing. No stopping it. It's insane. I mean, it. Maybe it's a grower problem. I have stayed away from them for a while because I used to have problems. It might have been an inexperienced thing. No, you know? no, no. It's dude. <laughs> cush, cush strains are definitely finicky. All right, all right. Um, cool. So we talked about that. The next biggest basic thing we need to get through, and maybe that's how we can kind of do this: is like the first half will be basic, second half will be diving into the details. Um, is the difference between fems, autos, regs, the different types of seeds and stuff that you can get because people think they know, but a lot of times they don't really know or yes. they're just going off what their buddy told them to get, but they don't understand what's behind them. Or the online marketing gets to them. You know what I mean? These seed companies are really, really good at marketing to people and consumers. And not that, you know what I mean, they're naive or anything. It's just they, they don't know yet. Sorry there, boys. Business is booming. Can't yeah, be mad. business is booming. <laughs> Do you have any Floraflex? Oh, it's, it's one of our buddies. Oh, our buddy. Hi. Hi. Hi, buddy. Um, yeah. I don't remember where we were now. Femmes, autos, regs. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, like I said, the online marketing. It's um, honestly the auto flowering market has just taken over by storm. 90% of people that come in to buy seeds, they just want auto flowers. And I can't, like, keep them on the shelf fast enough. So, I love them. You do? I do. Ugh. But I don't love them as a primary by okay. any means. Supplemental? Not even close. So, what I think is a good idea, depending on your space that you have, right? Okay. Make sure you have enough space in your veg that you're able to supply your next run. But if you can fit one in there, yes, it is a beautiful supplement, extra taste, added variety to your life. Yes. Yes. Let me tell you, I was so skeptical, but then I got one of the waffle beans yep. and ended up running those. And I was like, which one what, was it? What the hell is this fire that just happened in front of my eyes? Really? Monstrous. I'll show you pictures later. Monstrous for, for what it was. Monstrous. Right. And just. Was it the sofa? Beautiful. So yeah, yeah. So fems. There was a. Uh, Sour Fruity cast. patootie. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, see, those went quick. The Sofems went fast. Those those went fast. I mean, 
It seems like I could tell why. I don't know if everything's like that because I've only ran that, but like I've never even I've never even grown one. Oh, give it a shot, dude. Throw one in your veg. One, just throw one. Cause like, what's one plant take up? Is it critical to your space? No. Yeah, no. throw one in there. Extra little taste when you're like. Man, I'm tired of smoking my same thing that I've been smoking on. Hmm. Ooh. Yeah, a little, little bit different. of fruit. Yeah. Always <laughs> well, got to keep it right. I don't really understand how auto flowers work, though. Okay, so the theory is, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes. If no, you want to jump, no. jump in and like clean up more of the breeder aspect after. But the theory is that there is three varieties of cannabis, right? Indica sativa and ruderalis. Yep. And ruderalis is the ditch weed. It just does its thing. Yep. And so supposedly ruderalis will just flower regardless of photo period, whereas the indica sativa both, which you obviously understand, indica, short, sleepy, sativa, tall. Uplifting. There's also arguments that sativa is hemp and indica is actually all of like drug type cannabis there's a million different scientific <laughs> ar uh, arguments out there and ju they just the scientific community doesn't agree whatsoever on the origin or what there actually is going on uh the most common thing is what we've talked about one species cannabis sativa uh l which linnaeus um and then they just have like three or i'm sorry five chemo types i yep. might be saying the wrong thing maybe not yeah chemo types uh, with the THC dominant CBD, one to one, CBG, no cannabinoids. Right? Hmm. <clears throat> but anyway, back to what we were talking about. Ruderalis supposed to go, regardless of flower, goes anywhere, Russia up where it doesn't matter. This and and then this is uh, geographic origin stuff. Um, thank you, Sean Canale and the FLCC cannabis track. Um, <laughs> watch the show from last week. Anyway, no, <laughs> uh, the. Um, the thought is, is that this plant was up in Russia where it didn't need to have um, a specific photo period because it had really, really long summers, right? And it just wouldn't have been able to finish in time under that 12-12 cycle. It would have been too cold, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and so plants from there migrated down, other plants from the middle kind of migrated up, and people started realizing, hey, these kind of go, but they suck. What was that one? Lowrider. They yep. used to call it Lowrider was the original one. I, apparently it was like, okay, but it was not good. You know what I mean? It selective, was like, it was, selective breeding, you know what I mean? Over time. Took that with other varieties, put them together. Yep. And we'll get more into the details of how. Yep. And you get auto flowers out of that. Uh, like good auto flowers out of that. I have a buddy of mine playing with breeding the auto flowers now breeding them back and forth with photo periods, and then he hands out testers to people to see. Like, he hasn't back-crossed anything, so he's only, like, he's taken the pollen from... The next generation. I don't know if he took the pollen from the autoflower or if he took pollen from another one. Anyways, he forced one of them into pollen, took the pollen, crossed it with the other, and then handed out testers, and, like, 60% of them seem to be leaning Autos. autoflower. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yep. That's pretty cool. With a really low herm rate for only being crossed one time. And like no stability. Yeah. So he, if he could take that same pollen and hit the next generation, right, and then the next generation, right, you would stabilize. Getting too, getting yeah. too crazy. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, um, do you have to when you're breeding always use the same pollen source? No, no. you can choose from different males. I mean, some people will do multiple <laughs> males. I disagree with it. Yeah. So I wholeheartedly, I, I have one, and I'm I'm not gonna put them on blast, but I do have a customer that will take. Five or six males, put them in one pot, take the pollen from all of them, and then hit his females with it. I and like talk about variety of phenotypes. If you are looking would, for just straight variety, fine. But yeah. then you're you're pollen chucking. You're not breeding. Right. You know what I mean? Like you can't call yourself a breeder if you are taking five sets of pollen and just because you know the the female, you don't know what the hell male hit that. Maybe you got something cool and you got a double fertilization, but you don't know that. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? Like, and if you can't tell where the genetics came from, what good was doing the cross? Yeah, in unless my you're just, opinion, unless you're just playing for fun, right? <laughs> to to just have a variety, yeah. grow some seeds, yeah. find something crazy, and yeah. then you want to use that down the line for future breeding. Entirely different. And like, I don't want to knock people who are doing that. I'm please sorry. Please don't if do that something. if you're going to sell your seeds. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, please. In my opinion. 
Well, I mean, there's like some really great stuff that's come from bag seed though, which is arguably the same kind of thing. I guess. You know, so like you don't really know what the hell that father was. You have an idea of what the mother was if it came from a reputable source. That's, that's the but crazy like, thing about genetics themselves, right? Like nobody knows. You, you don't know what you're going to get. You just don't. No. And uh, they have, so, they, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, do they have like a certified seed provider? Like I'm buying this pack and this is from a source guaranteed fam. Like, or is there, does that exist yet? He has novelty collector items that yeah. are certified from the source. So I well I deal a lot directly with the breeders, but I'll be honest, there's no guarantee when it comes to buying fem seeds. You could even oh. and and also yeah. <clears throat> when you do the sex testing, you might get a, a a sample back that says it's a female. I would still watch that female very closely. You know, I would watch all of them closely, especially if it's a new variety phenotype, you know, cultivar strain, whatever you want to call it. If it's something you're not used to, you need to scope it out. And uh, I saw this morning on somebody's Instagram story, they did the sex testing um, with a different company than I use, so I can't vouch for either which one. Anyways, um, they got a test that came back female, and it hermed on them. So and herming is becoming more popular. Everything nowadays is, like, almost touched by cookies, and cookies have, like, hermed pretty easy. Um, really, I mean, any fem packs you buy, Watch for herms. Watch for male flowers, male parts. They might, yeah, they're going to be female, but they can still shoot a male flower. Well, that's any plant. Even a regular female has True. the capability of doing this. It does. It does. Especially if you are interrupting the dark cycle during flower. Correct. That is, I just, that is the biggest no no. That's, I, that, I have a buddy who will like just show people his tent. And uh, not, and I'm like, dude, I don't know how you haven't been all kind of seated out. Yeah, but like, that's not good. Don't that's keep testing good. your luck. But yeah, that's that's what happened with the the sex testing this morning. It was a reg pack. They found a female out of that reg pack, which technically they're supposed to be more stable, yep. more more sought out for breeding purposes. Um, and it's still hermed. Now, was that the grower or was that the genetic? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes you do everything perfect and you look and yeah, you're like, I mean, oh no. Bad genetics are bad genetics. And even coming from two banging plants, one of the grandparents or great grandparents could have been a little finicky one that yeah. they got lucky seeds from. All the testers worked out, but it was still kind of lurking there in the shadows and just, oh, boom, 10 generations later, here it popped out. And like, you can't always, if it's a one off, don't blame your breeder. Right. If it's a commonality, find I mean, a new breeder. Some, <laughs> some of the best seed companies that have like some of the, greatest fire you know what i mean even even them you can't like you can't put it on them it just it happens you're genetic breeding you know you don't know what the hell you're gonna get it's hard to really guarantee like yeah every single one's gonna female be a female none of them are gonna have issues no no definitely definitely can't guarantee that but if it's if it's a regular occurrence like that's risking your time oh, your yeah. money your investment like just find a new breeder. Don't some, you don't need to hate on them or anything. Sometimes but just, it's hard to even see. It might yeah, only oh shoot one male flower. You don't catch it because everything up top is looking slamming. Everything's gorgeous. And then pull up that skirt a little bit. And next thing you know, boop boop. Out pops the, out pops the willy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and well, that, sometimes it's right within like a bud, too. It'll be like you, it'll almost look like pistols coming out, except they don't elongate. And it, Big cock. <laughs> I mean, I've even seen just one, just one banana, just oh yeah, pop just a little nose out. And like, if you're not looking for it, you're never gonna know, you know until you see your seeds. I've, you know, what I mean? I've even had cultivars that literally would every single time they would show nanners at the very end, like. It would either be a sign that you went a little too far or conditions weren't just perfect. They would show nanners, but nothing would ever pollinate. So they were either it's too late infertile. In yeah, either too late in the game or they were infertile. I don't know. You know what I mean? But it was a solid genetic until it wasn't. And then once it became like really prevalent, it looks ugly in your product. Yeah. And honestly, I've seen a lot of stuff come out of the legal market that, you know, you look at this pretty jar with a pretty label, and then you look at the bud, and there's yellow Dude, nanners, yeah. like, all throughout it, and you're like, come on, I see, bro. I have seen it. I'm not going to drop any companies or anything. Yeah. In seed distributor pictures. Like, yes. popped it up, 
You're like, there's yep. literally a nanner Next. right there. Like yep. it's right, it's right, it's right there. Like you don't care. So you know what, what I mean? What like, is this nanner? It's, it's just like one single it, little. It literally looks like a banana. That it, like if you were to take a banana and shrink it down, put it in your bud with the stem in, okay. and just stuck like that little tip, the out. bottom part out. That's a pollen sack, and if it busts open, it will pu- seed out. It could seed out oh, your yeah. whole room. You could, may not. You could take that little nanner off. I call them nanners. I'm just like so it, bred into saying that. Uh, yeah, I mean it's old school, right? And and if you rub it in between your fingers, you will see the powder, the pollen. You know what yep. I mean? It's just on a very small scale. If that case, it's not a full sack that opened up, which can be uh, infertile, like was Rob was saying. Right. And and coming from a female, there's a higher likelihood that it's going to be infertile. But nanner. Yep, right there. <laughs> Says Google cannabis nanner. Yeah, look, look at that little guy. Wait, and that was in a seed. Like, in a catalog? picture. Well, no, like in, this is you know you know this and this strain, and the next thing you know, they got a picture of it, and it's like, oh, I counted flower. like five in one. And you're I like, swear to God, what I like the hell. I just like, do you check them before you put them up, or are these like breeder breeder provided? And and uh, anyway, moving on. I'm, I don't want to dog on anybody. Do you think? Power to you. I hope everybody makes money. But take your goddamn manners out if you're going to take pictures for a catalog. Yeah, get some tweezers. Or just find a different bud that's got less. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh. Anyway. Um, um, I, I do have a question. <laughs> yeah. What are some things that you can do or that you want to avoid that can cause plants to herm? Okay, so you definitely want to dial in your environment. Okay. Like, number one, dial in your environment. Number two, try and alleviate any stress. Like Justin said, don't go in there opening your doors during the dark period of your photo period plants. And if you're in like a tent or something, those things get holes easy. Unless you're in a gorilla, which I have yet to see yep. actually like just get holy from where. Unless you're in one of those, a lot of these get little pinholes just from opening and closing and opening and closing. And that little foil kind of wears and like. That shining on a calyx for long enough or at the right amount of time or a strong enough light or yep. whatever could be enough. And Absol- so like, absolutely. It could be kind of catastrophic. I tell people get inside, like before you put your plants in, once you have everything set up, get inside your tent, turn off all the lights and zip yourself in there. Yep. Or turn on, turn on the lights outside the tent. I'm sorry. Turn off your lights inside your tent, hop in there, make sure it's bright outside the tent and, and look for people. Zip yourself. Yeah. Look for people's with some, um, aluminum tape. You'll be all set. It sticks right to it. It's not going anywhere. No. And okay. if it maybe from like sprays after a while to wear off, guess what? Wipe it clean and put a new one. You'll be all set. Even what I find a lot of people with tents, duct work. They won't put like a 90 in it. They'll just like have, you know, one of the ducting holes open with a piece of duct work, like drawing air in or something. Not realizing that when the lights are off inside the tent, most oh likely they're not off outside the tent. And now you're just letting direct light in whether it be top or bottom yeah I mean, see i, I recommend over. putting a filter on everything yeah and like or put you, a 90 don't do a straight out at least 90 it down so like yeah the light's not gonna go you know what i mean yeah something like and they actually um little grow hack here uh mm. don't look in your hvac ducting for your intake because your exfil typically you're gonna have like a carbon filter on it you don't have to worry about the light yeah so for your intake, go look at the gutter supply. They have the black long gutter extensions, the four inch long gutter extensions that mm. are matte black that aren't gonna ricochet your light all up inside the no tubing. Kidding. Yeah, grow hack there, and they're pretty cheap. It's like ten bucks for the for the thing. No kidding. So, well worth it. Huh. And it will hook up. They have a six inch one actually too, a uh, four inch and six inch, and they will fit right up to a fan if you wanted to put a fan up to it as well. Hmm. So it's pretty. Not and you have to get fancy with your tape job, but yeah, like, right, right. Anyway, um, I, why don't we? Uh, what else? Uh, so environment. Sorry, I don't want to get away from that. Before before we stray too far from the environment, yeah, I want to tag on a couple yep. areas within that. Right. Yep. Too hot is going to be a problem. Too cold's not usually going to be a problem unless like, it's under fifty five. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because I mean, I've seen some pretty cold runs do okay. They just don't perform outdoor for some reason. Less prone but to having an issue, yeah. yeah. But indoor, man, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, depends on the. I guess depends genetics. on the cultivar too. Yeah, the yeah. genetics. Some are just stable as hell. Um, 
heat. Did I already say heat? Yep. I think I already said heat. Yeah. Um, light is going to be your biggest thing. If your light is inconsistent, if you have, if your timer gets something touched with that light and like you don't know it, power and goes out. 15 minutes on during the middle of the night because you're on one of those uh, digital timers and the little button got pushed in, like you're getting all seated out. Oh, yeah. More than likely. Um, Pollen from other people's clothes, another reason to keep other people out of your area, uh, not only for thief purpose purposes as well, because eyes equal mouths, and yeah. mouths <laughs> like to talk, right? And I don't know, that's just how it goes. But uh, um, but yeah, so th- those are the, the main things, right? The light, the heat, um, any, anything else. If you're in there and you're breaking branches all the time like and freaking it out, or you've got over... Um, nutrition as well is a problem. Uh, am I missing anything? I mean, well, even defoliating too much. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, oh, yeah. Like if some strains you go in, say, because generally you do a cleanup before you go in, a day 21, a day 45, and then you harvest it, you know, 65, 66 days, whatever it is. Um, if you go in there and you do too hard of a defol in the middle, you know, say you go in a day 30 something and you're like, ah, fuck it, no big deal, a couple days late, and you go pluck, you know, it depends. Some like it and some just, just will not. Out. Yeah, some, if you take more than 25, 30% and you leave them pretty bare, you're going to be looking. Yeah, I mean, I don't recommend anybody ever going over 25, 30% anyway. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I'm, I'm of the, I try to, so we're in it. we're in a completely synthetic environment, but for whatever reason, I like to try and like, I, I guess I got this from the Dude Grow Show, of like trying to simulate like, deer and rabbits eating so like every time i'm in there i'll just pull off the yellow ones you know what i mean yeah, yeah and yeah. maybe a few of the big fan leaves and get them out of the way but like i view those as solar panels yeah you oh, know yeah. what i mean and so i want as many of them as are good as possible and i actually heard today i think it was on jordan rivers podcast okay uh he had somebody on talking about all these different types of growing and he said that Anything that's not receiving 200 PPFD, adios. Hmm. That's like a good where that leaf is net positive. It's actually helping hmm. as opposed to so just being a So what do you use, sink. like a little meter to test each leaf? Yeah. You get one of those. Well, I, I've, got, I've got a couple at the store. The photo bio ones are pretty good. Okay. And yeah, it'll tell you exactly your PPFD all <laughs> anywhere you are in the tent. You can test everywhere. Really? Yeah. And dude, it's crazy to see how much it varies. From just from like as you move it, it could change a couple hundred. Mm-hmm. It's nuts. What's ideal? So I mean, a... I like to I like to be up around anywhere at least eight or nine, right? And ideally up to like fifteen in commercial setting where you can really bang out lights and really do your thing, and you don't have to worry about overheating and burning your house down and stuff like that. Now, if you're they're get... finding that you can do over eighteen, nineteen, two thousand PPFT linear returns as long yeah. as as long as you're running the rest you're running co2 generally for them to take that much intensity you know what i mean and your vpd again has to be like dialed in pretty good yeah and at home at home if you're going up over over really over like 11 or 12 i would recommend running co2 Is for that 1200 well. or the number 12, 12. 1200, 1200 yeah. sorry yep yeah yep. <laughs> i mean that's when you like buy leds most of them will have that chart. Yeah. You know what I mean? They give you the chart where the corner numbers are generally the lowest, middle numbers are the highest. That's your PPFD chart. Um, and most people actually judge their numbers, well, at least me, and when I talk to my customers, based on the outside numbers. Most LED companies, of course, the intensity is going to be most intense in the middle. Middle, you know what 12 I mean? inches from the light. You want to see the <laughs> average. How far does it really drop off to the, those corner numbers, and how far does it fall off at your end plants? Where do you plants? need to pick up with your next light? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you're in like a 4x4 four four grow tent and you go buy an HLG 600, you know what I mean? You might have to turn that bad boy down to 50%, 60% to do better for yourself than if you had it up to 100% yeah, and you can't control it. Yeah, because stress and extra just... It, that's a lot of energy inside mm-hmm. a tent, right? Coming down on, especially if you can't control that environment perfectly. Yeah, that that perfect harmony. Like and and so the HLG three hundred. I was in there. I think I was probably like fourteen inches or so underneath there with the. Ooh, um, that's close. I, yeah, <laughs> it was running like 1,300, 1300 PPFD. 
They looked a little bit stressed out. Yeah, yeah. Just, no, I mean, it wasn't like bad. I, good, good returns. You know what I mean? And really, it was just the one call to VAR that was a little bit more stressed than the rest. But, I mean, that's that's pretty good. But I don't use CO2, right? Because in my opinion, if I'm running an exhaust fan, that's yeah, a waste of my money. It is. You know? It really and is. Sealed room. Sealed yep. room. Sealed room to run CO2 properly. Otherwise, like Justin said, you're just like watching dollars go out. Shooting money out the window. Yeah. Have But you really can grow as long as you have a good intake. Ambient CO2 is plenty. I mean, look at what these plants do outside. Look what these plants do in greenhouses. Do you want to hear something crazy? This is no BS. And this just was last week. A customer of mine, we just, I mean, he just put together a sick sealed room. His first run went flawless. He was running CO2 the whole time. Brand new autopilot CO2 controller was keeping himself, you know, between 11, 1300 parts per million. Nothing too crazy. This run, we don't know why. And if anybody can even give me a tip on why this is happening, his CO2 is five to 6,000 parts per million with no CO2 in the room now. We've switched his meters out three separate times. And put they're him, all reading that. Put them in different rooms and the other rooms, they're reading like four or 500, like general normal air. Put it in this one room. Five, six thousand. And, and he's the, not supplementing? No. No. Literally, his t- he had his tank hooked up, everything hooked up, and the tank will not kick on. Then he un- you know, took off the tank, was like, maybe it's leaking. Took the tank completely out of the room. No CO2 source in the room at all. Completely sealed room. Five to six thousand. Is there a propane line in the room no. that got pierced? No, the furnace isn't even like anywhere near. Anywhere near. Yeah, that's wild. I don't. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. His, normally, like if you have CO two that high, generally your plants like the leaves will look somewhat okay, but they're like dry and crispy almost. These plants are like the craziest prehistoric looking plants I've ever seen. Good in a good way. Oh yeah, like you're talking parts per million that high is like dinosaur era like air. Yeah, that's that's wild. That's yeah, insane. I mean, we we shouldn't be breathing that. That's for sure. Oh God, I told him no. don't stay in the room for like more than a minute. Yeah, or keep no. the door wide open because yeah. literally you will pass out. Public service announcement, people: if your CO two gets really high, yeah, your ears are gonna start get ringing. That checked out. <laughs> get the hell out of there. <laughs> You're gonna start get blinking. Some ventilation yeah. going on, and if it doesn't fix itself with ventilation, you may, you better call somebody. Right. <laughs> and if you're not, if you're not doing it on the books. Make sure you fix yourself before you call that person. Yeah, exactly. Um, quick question. I obviously uh, am getting ready. To yep. Get set up. Yep. One thing I don't have is CO two. Is that something you got at the shop? Yes. So what's like, that look like? So it's literally a twenty pound cylinder. Um, you get a regulator that screws on to that cylinder, almost like you would screw a cylinder onto a you know paintball gun. Same thing. You you screw on this uh, regulator. You could hook it up to a timer and try and do it analog. Um, it's really hard to stay accurate that way. It's best eventually, you know, if you're going to do CO2, invest in a controller that has, you know, it has the monitor, it has the the brain that, you know, and and once that sensor uh, goes within a, a bandwidth, you know, you want it set at 1,000. If it drops to 900, it kicks your, your CO2 on. Right. Once it gets back to where you want it, it turns it off, and it stays within, like, 100 parts per million of CO2. Um I mean, really, it's smart to go with a monitor controller. Don't don't yes. try to go one way or the other. It's just easier to have it all in yeah. one. And I personally, and a lot of people don't find this, but I like to separate things, right? So I like to separate my CO2 controller from my environmental controller yeah. from my, you know, this controller because there's a great company out there. I'm not going to say them, but they have, a, you know, their brain and they have an adapter and a plug-in for everything. I mean, you could fully automate with this system. God forbid that thing goes down. And you don't have a backup? That's a good point. Oh, dude. <laughs> oh, my God. That's Gotta cat- fix everything. That is catastrophic. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Because I was thinking, like, it would make it great to have, like, a little iPad on there. Boop, 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 boop. And maybe it, even run it from your phone. Or do and that and have them all backed up as well, like, I on guess. regular. That way you could still monitor it from that central unit on your phone doing all those they things. They do have the app and everything, you know what I mean? But yep. that's I guess that's even rendered useless once the actual brain goes, goes out bad. Right. I mean, you're kind of asked out at that point. But then at least you know if you have the uh, the redundancies built in of the individual components as well. So what I would say if I was coming from your corner yep. is build in the individual components, and then once you have that, 
get the convenience of the all-in-one so that you can monitor it all in one safe. place. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then if that thing goes, at least you have the backups for the other ones that were already there. Yep, yep. Um, This got a little bit away from our genetics and breeding conversation, but... As they do. <laughs> I think it's probably a decent time to wrap up part one and kind of be able to next time transition over to uh, diving a little bit deeper into actually breeding and what some of these real breeding terms are. Um, but real quick, I just want to point out that the difference between hemp and cannabis, just so people know, is an entirely arbitrary 0.3 legal definition that was drawn in from the laws from a paper from Small and Cronquist in 1976 that was never intended to be for any sort of legal purposes whatsoever. It was just there for their distinguishing their data <laughs> and was then called upon later for legal things. So just to put that out there. <laughs> anyway, um, we are going to be diving right back in here with some more breeder talk real soon nice. and getting into a little bit more of that. Yeah. So um, stay tuned and elevate your state of mind. Thanks to our friends here at Rockbox Recording and Production in Rochester, New York. They are a full professional podcast and video studio designed by a radio guy for podcasters. Audio, video, voiceovers, editing, whatever. Mouth off at Rockbox at rockbox.com. You can follow Cannabis Cum Laude on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Cannabis. Type Cannabis Cum Laude into your search bar and you should be able to find us, but the links will also be posted in the episode notes as well. If you want to help support the show, head on over to Patreon, and that will ensure that we're able to keep the best quality sound and video coming to you on a regular basis. And if you liked what you heard today, please don't forget to rate and review the show.